I've created this now where I didn't want anyone to see the pain from my 20 year old experience. So I was like, I'm going to be the best at getting chicks. I'm going to be the best at getting laid. And no one will notice that actually I am dying inside. Welcome to Beyond the Beers. Conversations with men that break the stereotype. We men love a good yarn, some banter, even better over a beer or 10. Sadly though, for many men, it never goes beyond that, if at all. Beyond the Beers is a place for men to actually go beneath the surface level. To learn, to listen, to laugh and grow. I'm your host, Mike Campbell, author, men's coach, and founder of the School of Personal Mastery for Men. Let's break through stereotypes together. Let's go beyond the beers. Welcome to today's show. I'm coming to you today from Vancouver and my good buddy, Mark Rosehouse. Now, Mark and I ran an event here in Vancouver recently, and of course, I've been lucky enough to sit down with him today and have a little bit of a chat beyond the beers. Now Mark's a guy I met uh, on the internet a few years ago <laughs> and he was someone that I read an article of his and I was like wow this really lands for me. I gotta reach out to this guy and, uh, and and create a connection and hopefully you know have some conversations that go beyond the beers. That has led to us um, running an event and sitting down today. I cannot wait for you guys to learn uh, a little bit more about Mark, hear some of his perspective and some of his stories. So Mark, welcome buddy, let's get into the show. Thank you, sir. So excited to be, I was going to say be here, but it's actually my house. It's your house. So, yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me but that. excited to be on, be on Beyond the Beers because I've watched you from across seas do all these cool events and I'm like, damn, I need beer and talking <laughs> and all this. So I'm excited to be part of it at least. I'll be coming to Australia, of course, eventually. I can't miss out on the live experience. Absolutely. So let's kick into it. Now, if I were to pump your name into Google... <laughs> yeah. What would I find? Oh man, you find the first couple of pages just filled with my content, just yeah. like uh, my website, my Instagram, all of all just content about relationships. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So then, I, so give us a little bit of the the full one one on you. What do you spend your time doing? What what kind of you know grinds your gears and lights you up? Grinds my gears and lights me up. Uh, relationships, like the constant, the just the how do we have really powerful, engaging, connected relationships? For me, the passion comes from the understanding that how we relate to other people, how and not just romantically, but just in general, uh, will be the single greatest predictor of our success in life. Mm. Which I mean, what a powerful skill to learn and. If you just add on to that the power of a romantic relationship and a connection with a partner, um, friendships can still provide that really great health benefit. But yeah. really healthy, loving, fulfilling relationships are actually very protective from a health standpoint. Mm. You know, they actually preserve our neurology. You know, they help us fight against cardiovascular disease and cancer. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I'm not just spewing BS. Like that's <laughs> that's based on research. Yeah, I've read some of the research study. on that. Absolutely, and it's fascinating, right? And in short. The, the, the deeper connections and the more connected relationships we have, the better off, very broadly, our physical health. Right? Yeah, like when they looked at cholesterol, blood pressure, what neighborhood you grew up in, it didn't matter. It was just the quality of your relationships, not and not just romantic, which is, yeah. I think, important because Beyond the Beers provides at least a framework and a space in order for people to build in deep friendships. Hmm? I mean, for men, it's... Um, you know, really important, we know that, but a depth of conversation with another person is important so we feel seen, so we feel heard. And, you know, I mm-hmm. think from the power, like when you look at the research of divorce, when when a heterosexual couple gets divorced, the man tends to actually not recover emotionally as well as the woman. And that's because in the research, at least, theoretic, the theory is that when women leave a relationship, they can turn to their friends and they turn to their friends about two yep. thirds of the time in while they're married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but guys really we do like a third of the time. So when we lose our partners, we tend to lose really our social network in a lot of ways. Yeah. And then we, we go to what we know, which is kind of like trying to, to you know, insulate and, and, and go very insular. Figure this out ourselves. Oh my right? god, yeah, right. We are <laughs> and it, it doesn't tend to work out well because our way of figuring it out is well at least for me, I'll speak for myself, <laughs> was drinking and trying to get chicks. So, yeah. You know, you know what? I'm out. good, I can get back out there, no worries. I'm a little bit heartbroken, but let me get back out there and then heal it, that kind of logic, right? Oh my gosh. You know, think of like my relationship healing in my twenties was not very much healing. I think I hurt more people than I healed in that in that time. Yeah. 
we can do damage in that in that uh, in that state when we don't quite understand what's going on for us. I think right, and that's where the conversation is so goddamn important. So let's get into that a little bit beyond the beer. So a human connection specialist is, is the label that I love, the, the title that I love about yours. But if we go to Google, we'll find some of your content. Yeah. What won't we find? Give, how did you get into this? Give us the backstory. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when I, 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 we were just talking about breakups. What do we do with them? You know, when I was 27, I was engaged to a really wonderful woman. and But there was just something in my gut, in my heart, that I'd been feeling for quite some time, that it just didn't feel like the right thing, the right step, the right whatever. And um, it was the first time when I got engaged, it was the first time that I really acknowledged those types of feelings. I really even started Mm. to ask myself, like, why am I in a relationship? Why am I choosing this? And I think maybe... In response to those feelings? Yeah, and I, at first would, before I even got engaged, I felt uncertain, and I would talk to my friends, and I would talk to family, I would talk to, you know, tons of people, and I would ask them, like, here's the way I'm feeling, what do you think it is, and the answer I'd get more often than not was, you're a guy, you're just probably afraid of commitment, and that felt very dismissive, and also because I wasn't taught a lot beyond that, I was like, well, maybe I am just afraid of commitment. Yeah, maybe, that can make sense. Totally, right? Does that what makes sense? Well, and then I was like, well, I need to figure it out, so I'll do the commitment thing and see how this goes. And um, I had been dating her for five years, and again, she was everything on the checklist, so I was, mm. you know, she's a really wonderful person, so I at least had that, you know, yeah. that, that confounding factor dealt with. But then that almost makes the confusion, the confusion more confusing. It really These was. things are ticked, so what is this and here? That's exactly, it was yeah. like, I didn't know what the feelings meant, and I think like our emotional fluency comes from being able to at least observe a feeling and then gather information to figure out what feelings mean what things. Yep. And that takes practice. And so, anyways, what ended up happening is, as soon as we got engaged, I started to look up things on the internet, like how do you know if she's the one? I hit porn too, maybe a little bit. <laughs> But I would look up, like, how do you know if she's the one? How do you, you know, all those different things. Uh-huh. And I really didn't... Searching have, to answer these questions. Basically. Yeah, right. because I didn't want to, like, let go of this relationship and make this big mistake. Mm-hmm. If, you know, and, and I don't think there's ever a right answer. That's what's so challenging. No, it's, but you're no, searching for it. Totally. Hopefully and like, on the internet. What am I supposed to... Yeah, right, on the internet. Of all places where if you're like, my stomach hurts, you have cancer. So <laughs> it's... So I go along this and I'm like looking it up and of course there's not a lot of men who have posted their emotions. Yeah, so when was this? Give us a timeline. This was 11 years ago, almost okay. 12. Right. And um, so I started to write my story on this forum that was, uh, it was a website that's now gone. It's, it was called The Runaway Bride and it was women mainly. Mm. And so I write my story, of course, right? Like women congregating in this community to support each other is just innately inherent in their DNA. Yeah. So I'm like posting my story on there and they're asking me lots of questions. You know, in a, in a lot of ways, it was the first time that I felt non judgmentally heard. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't someone else's agenda about my engagement. It was yeah. like, we, we, we don't even know you. Yeah, we don't know you. So we're we can actually speak to it very differently. Yeah, yeah, which was the first time I had felt, at least that I can remember, that I felt this like objective listening to my story not through how it's going to affect them. Because yeah. a lot of, I feel like my All family and my friends... All tied up emotional chaos. <laughs> yeah, where it was like, well, if Mark gets disengaged, then what happens to yeah. me and our friendships and all those mm-hmm. things? Anyway, so I um, I got this one woman asked me these like incredibly powerful questions. I'll never forget them. Oh. The first one was, um, if she left you tomorrow, would you be okay? And I was like, yeah, I would. And then the next question was, mm. can you imagine what the altar would look like of you waiting for her and what that would feel like? And I was like, I can't. It like made me feel anxious and uncertain. And then the last question she asked me was, um, could someone else love her better? And I was like, yeah. And that was the question that shifted everything for me. Yeah, yeah. Because then all of a sudden I realized that my fear of ending a relationship because of how I'd be judged or, mm-hmm. or just being a failure. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to work out. What does yeah. that mean about me? Especially because she's, she's really a, a phenomenal Takes all those human. boxes. So then it was like, who am I? Because then people, people would say to me, like, well, if you leave, you'll know you'll have made a mistake. And I'm like, oh, oh, they already know the future. Fuck. <laughs> right? like, and I swear, I didn't know. Um, yes. Yes. Beyond yes. the beers. Fuck yeah, it's a great game. Um, so I, that was the first time I really had this perspective that it wasn't about me, 
Yeah. And I was all of a sudden like, she's worthy of being loved by someone who really mm -hmm. wants to show up for her. Because, of course, the follow-up question to can someone else love them better is, do you want to? Mm. And I didn't want to. And I had to honor that. I just didn't want to. And I didn't know why. You know, I, I look back now. Yeah, trying to that. force it. It's like trying to first put a pig in a round hole, right? And you can feel it, you know. It feels like you're pushing a big rock up a big hill, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, of course, in hindsight now, I can see all the reasons why and, and all of that. Um, because I don't really ever think I let her love me. I don't think I ever really let her in. And, yeah. and that was just part of a greater pattern that was going on in my life that I didn't even know I was in the middle of. Um, so can you dive into that very quickly for us when you say, I don't think I really let her love me? Yeah. What do you mean by that? How do you see that play out now that you're dealing with people's relationships a lot of the time? Yeah, because, of, you know, when someone is in a relationship and they're thinking about leaving, you know, you, you get asked the question a lot. Well, I do. Um, you probably do too. The question of like, how do you know if you should go mm. or stay? Yeah. And when am I, when am I, you know what, this is not, this is not good. I need to end it. Or when do I need to push on through and yeah. do the work? Right? And will it, because of course we want to know, well, if I push it through, will it get better? Yeah. And you know, we want to know the outcome before yeah, we even to do the vulnerable part. It doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> and so it, it, you know, like you said the other day in a presentation, like the answer to everything is it depends. Mm. And it really did depend in, in, in that. If you're in that situation, you know, I look for things now where it's like, do you usually abandon things when they're about to either get deeper yeah. and more vulnerable, or do you abandon yourself generally? Mm. And so a really great question, because people need to understand, like, do I have a pattern of abandoning things when they're about to get deeper and more loving? Or, yeah. And do people... And more challenging in general, right? Yeah. yeah. And... And do I tend to abandon my own needs and my own self? And maybe this relationship is a representation of that. The only one who knows the truth is the person asking yeah. themselves those questions. Yeah. Um, but it at least invites a different form of exploration because, you know, I then will ask someone, like, what's abandoning you? Is staying or going abandoning yourself? Mm. And that's a great way to at least get this idea of what your pattern is because then maybe breaking our pattern is, is staying and showing up, but actually doing the work because staying and not doing anything doesn't actually work. Yeah. You know, staying and being Hoping that something changes right. without changing maybe anything. Maybe they'll figure out all their broken stuff and I'm fine. I and can then, stay. Yeah. Whatever's going on here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Put around me. So yeah. yeah, for me, the the part about not being really able to let someone love me yeah. was, was from a deeper heartbreak from when I was 20. Okay. You know, relationships always came really easily to me in that, like I was maybe just like a romantic, you know, I can remember in high school dating my girlfriend in high school and getting like a rose for a one month anniversary, which is cheesy as shit. I get it. <laughs> but you know, that's sort of yeah. what I was like. I was like, excited that speaks to something that. else about you. Yeah. And I, you know, in, like, in hindsight. <laughs> I can remember that and remember being, you know, really happy and excited about being able to share partnership and being able to create partnership. And then, um, when I was in, my second relationship in my, uh, I was 19 and 20, she went away to the States for school. And uh, this this just like remembering this, this, you'll now see why I didn't let anyone love me for a little bit, for a little bit, for like 14 years. In a relationship as well, buddy. I was in yeah. many relationships in those 14 years and yeah. I never really let anyone in, which is kind of crazy. Um, when I, I'll talk about that awareness <laughs> when I got it, it was a fucking slap to the face. Um, but I was, I, I, so I was dating this woman. Mm -hmm. She went away to the States on a soccer scholarship. And when she left, we made this agreement that, you know, we could see other people. We'd just tell each other. Yeah. Now, already, let me just walk you through this disaster. <laughs> already, I didn't want to see other people. Yeah. So I've already sold out you my felt own like You intention. needed to say that to keep, you know, to keep her to happy. like out of fear. Yeah. And I was yeah. 19, 20, like... If I don't say this, I might lose her. Totally. I had poor boundaries. I'm like the product of the nice guy generation, you know, like men are bad, men don't... Whatever you want, let me just make everything uh, okay. Totally yeah, please Whatever makes you happy. Which doesn't please anybody. Yeah, but also, you know, you touch on that, but that's something I come across a lot. Guys go, yeah, I always put myself last, and I'm always, you know... And they might not have those words, pleasing everyone, but when we look at it, that's what's happening. Yeah. yeah, it's such a fascinating pattern because when you put everyone else first, you resent them, but it's you who put them first. Yeah. You know, it's like the fucked up... And there's not much left for you. And that's no. where that resentment and all that stuff comes in. And I think the yeah. most important thing there a lot of the time is, if I'm doing everything for you, there's not much left 
for me. So therefore, I slowly become more tired and all this kind of stuff is in for, and then yeah. I can't give as much to you. Right? No, and then I'm mad that you didn't tell me to take care of me because you're supposed to help me. Yeah. Like it's the pattern of codependence where we use the anger and resentment as power, you mm-hmm. know, which which we're probably yeah. used to and, from our and family. And trying to leverage with that shit, right? Totally. We bring it up when it's not appropriate. Well, and we don't know that the actual way through something like that is prioritizing ourselves and having great boundaries. Mm. But most of the time when people are giving away all of them for a relationship, they never really knew how to have their own needs as a child. So that's yeah. usually the pattern that comes through. Um, and so, so, although I don't know where mine came from, this specific nightmare but she goes to the states and we're like yeah we could see other people who and you're 19 to, right so you're also other. pretty in terms of emotional party. awareness and stuff in relationships i'd like to think i had it figured out now you're gonna find out i had nothing figured out <laughs> so she goes away she comes back at canadian thanksgiving because there's u.s thanksgiving right too so um, U.S. people don't tend to know, no offense if you're American, but they don't tend to know that there's a Canadian Thanksgiving. Like, I'll get asked, do you celebrate Halloween in Canada? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah we do. Yeah. Holy shit. So <laughs> she, she comes back for Canadian Thanksgiving, and her friend has also gone down there with her, another woman. So they both come back, and they bring their friend with them. And so their friend, who happens to look like Adonis, and his giant masculine human. I think he was the running back of the football team, just to keep it easier for me. Yeah. He had like 10 abs when there's only really eight. I didn't actually see his abs, but anyway, I just assume. So I'm at Thanksgiving. But that's dinner. also an important part of the story, right? Instantly, you, you're speaking now with Richard Street, but at the time, you're creating all these stories as oh, soon as they I'm walk through the door. Threatened. Yeah. Like this guy is like good looking, he's the running back of the football team. Which, I mean, we know historically in any movie, it's the running back and the quarterback who are like the badasses. No one cares about the kicker. (laughs) It's a shit about the kicker. Yeah, so so your mind's going on overdrive straight away. Yeah, of course, because now I'm like, who is this guy, right? Mm. You know, there's been no transparency before. Mm. Like, oh, my friend from the state. you know he was turning up? Yeah, but you know, it was introduced, at least in my memory, I I don't want to like, but I'm pretty sure this is accurate. She... She had told me, and her friend was probably, like, co-covering, but mm. she had told me, like, he's going to come back and wants to experience Canadian Thanksgiving. I'm like, shit's the same as U.S. Thanksgiving. Yeah. You eat fucking turkey and stuff, and you're thankful for, I mean, really, Thanksgiving is not a really great thing to celebrate from a historic standpoint, because we all know this. Well, if we don't, you can look it up. Yeah, but it, it speaks to the fact that there's something else going on. So totally. Because probably like, not this coming because he really wants to check out Canadian Thanksgiving. Yeah, you want to stuff another turkey. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, is that okay to say? Yeah, it's okay Absolutely. to say. So, he arrives. And so, I will, I will never forget this. I was sitting at Thanksgiving dinner and it was like, me, if I remember the Where table is set up, this house? is at her parents' Right. House. So, it's okay. me, her ma, or her dad, her stepdad, her mom, and then I'm pretty sure it was like him and her, or him and her, but it was like I wasn't beside her, right? Mm-hmm. So I do remember that. And I was sitting there and I'm like, what the fuck? Like this, this there's something going on here. I could feel the energy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm being totally fucked over here. Like I'm actually having it rubbed in my face though. Like there hasn't been transparency yeah. mm-hmm. and I'm sitting at fucking dinner. What am I doing here? And you know, like, I, I was so hurt, you know, like this deep, deep, deep hurt. And I was watching what was unfolding and I was like, holy shit, like this is fucking bullshit. Like, so I, I remember being at the base of the stairs because the house, you like drove, th- to get in the house, you drove through the garage and then through a door up yeah. the stairs. So I was at the base of the stairs talking to her. She was sitting on the stairs and the, the memory for me is blurry because I remember crying. And I just remember being like, are you guys together? Like, I can't believe this is happening. And I left. And, you know, in, in historically, or at least in hindsight, um, now that I've sort of done the work to unpack all of that, there's always um, pain there because for me the pain was, which, you know, is processed, but I can just feel so much the old young me yeah. of like, I really just left him there. Like the guy who really wanted to love all out, who really cared about 
relationship and women and uh, respect. God, yeah. I left him there. And the story in my head that I figured out years later, so don't <laughs> this wasn't a brilliant move then, was when I let people love me, they destroy me. Yeah. And so I never let anyone past that point mm. till I was talking to Kelly Marceau, who's a really brilliant relationship writer. She writes a lot about men, actually, great writer. And I was talking to her, and she looked at me, and she said, have you actually ever let anyone love you? And I was like, who the fuck is this chick? Yeah. Like, and then I was like, oh, no. I hadn't. I hadn't let anyone love me in 14 years. Which yeah. was so just crazy. kind of at arm's length. You know, my magical move after Thanksgiving, because, of course, following Thanksgiving is Halloween, which everyone's, you know, dressed as dirty nuns, dirty nurses, dirty whatever, right? Um, and I went to a bar on Halloween. This was not a great perfect storm. Halloween, alcohol, heartbreak. It's yeah, like 19 years old, 20 years old. I've kissed five girls in my life. I've slept with two. You know, like, I was a, a pretty, like, um, I don't want to say respectful because that makes it sound like sex randomly isn't respectful. It can be. Um, but I would say that I was just very particular about who I shared yeah. my sexual energy with. Mm. Um, I didn't, they, I just very much valued intimacy. And so for the first time in my life, I made out with three chicks on the dance floor. The time traveled through all of it. I ended up bringing a chick home to my parents' house. Come on, rookie take home move. Oh, with really? dress like a devil. She oh, really? dressed like a devil. No irony there, right? So I bring her home. I'm like trying, <laughs> we're making out. And I'm telling her all the stuff I'm going to do to her. Now realize I've never actually been yeah. in a, a well, one I am night in stand. deep water right now. I have never been in an intimate moment that wasn't important to me. Mm. This one was just an escape from my bullshit. So mm. I'm like telling her all the and awesome to prove to cool yourself stuff. that you're still, I can do this, I can pull it in, uh, right? Yeah, and I'll actually speak to that right after. But I go, so I'm like, everything's all go, you know, and then I go to have sex with her and I can't get an erection for the first time in my life. So I'm like, what the fuck is going yeah. on here? Like, there was no, I wasn't prepared for like the putting a marshmallow in a piggy bank moment, right? Like, I needed a shoehorn or a kickstand <laughs> to get this in. So I'm thinking to myself, like, all systems should be go. I've never been in like a two nipple of vagina situation where it wasn't like, yes. Yeah, there we go. So then I'm sh experiencing like shame, like how do I get this thing to rally? Yeah. And so um, I didn't get it to rally. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I did. I didn't do anything. I think I just, you know, went down on her as a way of like getting myself out of this situation. Um, and she left the next morning. My parents were really proud when she walked out while they were having coffee mm. and breakfast. Yeah. And my dad's like, you want to talk? You're making Anything? some interesting life choices right now. Uh -huh. And you know, that was the beginning of, because I would, I would walk through, I was in university at the time. I'd walk through the halls of university and I just was not attracted to women and not men either, but I just wasn't, I normally was like, girls you know and I wasn't and so then which I didn't understand because mm. I didn't know that like this deep level of grief yeah and all that shame as well it's just the good like that is quite cute <laughs> like I wasn't even good at one night stands now so yeah. I was really good at relationships I thought apparently that imploded now I'm not even good at one night stands and as a guy if you don't have that yeah. so if and I'm not a sexual well, warrior an important point there right yeah. There's so much external validation from our peer group around our ability to get laid. Well, well yeah, and I'm playing on sports teams where, like, the locker room stories are not about, like, you're such a good romantic partner. <laughs> yeah. Like, you really, I watch you slow dance with your partner <laughs> and you just care so much. No, I can right? See how, like, how great you are at relationships. Yeah, like, the conversation is like, did you grind on a speaker last night? Oh, did you get a BJ? Like, yeah. you know, and, and I started to really where I used to hold my integrity so much, in a lot of ways, don't get me wrong, I stepped out of it, but now I was just out of it. Yep. Like, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I was so confused that I wasn't a sexually desiring women. I couldn't get a boner when I was trying to. I could do it no problem with myself or when, you know, when you wake up in the morning. 
So I started to realize that my erection was very much emotionally trauma-based. Mm. And I had a friend who once said, you know, I just accepted the fact that my cock is connected to my heart. And I was like, yeah, they all are. I mean, physiologically, they obviously are. But but yeah. I, I think as a man, that like was something I tried to bang my way out of. Mm. You know, eventually what I yeah. ended up doing was drinking enough to get rid of my anxiety and my morals. Mm. And and so my values would disappear because I drank so much. Yeah. And then So that big that emotional sense. connection to your boner, basically, was numbed through booze. Yeah, I would drink and then I mean even in my late twenty because I you know I had the five year relationship mm. that ended when I was twenty seven and then I went back to old pattern but mm. for a little bit. Yeah, because it was still there. Right. Oh yeah, so you'd been in this whole relationship, relationship, but it was still this person may hurt me in every you know unconscious thought process. This person may hurt me, so just be cagey, be right. guarded. Yeah. yeah, so so I never let her pass that moment, mm. so I've still not healed to anything past that. Mm. And I don't know any of this. I'm just fucking of course. driving. My but you were starting to life. recognize clearly, you know, something in that relationship, right? Like this doesn't feel right. Yeah, yeah. my integrity was starting to actually really. I was in integrity in my relationship, you know, that, that was one thing that was true, but I was never really fully in it, you mm. know, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, I used to say that it felt like, you know, there's, it just wasn't my person and, and that's true, you know, she isn't my person to be with for the rest of my life, yeah. but she was the person who taught me so much about myself, you know, mm. because she always invited me to show up as a, as a man and to be a good man mm -hmm. and I had no fucking clue, like, I literally could not have stepped into that space with her because I didn't know how. Yeah. And, and it took that relationship ending and me leaving it to start me on the journey of this understanding of relationship to be like, because that, that was like this, all of a sudden I was like, I'm going to fucking understand mm. everything about relationships. Hold on, relationships, I wasn't, that happened when I was 20 and I, I thought I was good and then being <laughs> single dude, getting laid, I thought, uh, uh, so there's, it's kind of just the message has come to you again very clearly. How you need to understand this shit. Yeah. And yourself. Well, and then I'm step. Now I'm like 27. I have a good job, so I'm like sort of like in the perfect placement from a social structure of masculine yeah. ability. I'm I'm fairly, you know, I'm a salesperson, so I'm fairly charismatic. My identity is based on this charisma and humor. Yeah. And 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 I'm also like, whoa, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So I start looking at all the science on relationships because before all my learning was like how to win friends and influence people and how to you know i was building relationship our sales training programs and they were all based on how to fucking manipulate mm. how to get anyone to do anything that was the yeah. book i had you know yeah. and then i was reading pickup artist stuff yeah you know and i was like Again, manipulation total yeah. not like oh I'm, i don't have to pretend to be a guy of high self-worth if i actually just become one Mm -hmm. I was just this mask. So I think it's a, a really great point, and I'd love you to think into that a little bit more. Pretending to be someone of self-worth, or acting as if you have, as, as opposed to having it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do the whole time. You know, so it was like, in the pickup artist world, what you're learning is how to create this persona of being someone of high self-worth. So, mm -hmm. you know, like wearing flashy clothes, you know, what we were saying is like, so, they, so they could peacock, yeah. buying a really fancy car because it, you, you know, it makes it so you don't give a shit about other people, mm -hmm. which is an alpha male status trait, um, approaching women, making fun of them because you don't care. If yeah, so pretending you. you don't fear rejection. Exactly. Right? Versus not fearing rejection. Yeah, because you know that you are a good human who is worthy of great love, mm -hmm. which is a deep, you can't, you can fake that for a moment, but here's the thing, when you're picking up anyone, just like how to get a guy, same, they teach the same things, how to get, send six texts, they get you a text back, yeah. like, they're teaching you how to create behaviors that make you appear like you got your shit together, mm -hmm. and of course, when you're actually face to face with heartbreak, with rejection, with an argument, just a trigger, your truth will come out. Yeah, the, yeah. the the part behind you, the unhealed yeah. little boy, the yeah. unhealed little girl. As soon as all girl. that mask crumbles away, right? It's not, right? It's like, shit, I was faking a lot of that. I feel like I'm out of my teeth now, yeah, basically. Totally. And that became sort of like the... I was learning all these manipulative techniques and I was mm -hmm. learning all these things and then I all of a sudden was like, wait, why am I really... You know, I was I was good at sales. I succeeded. I, was, I, I really excelled at it. And I'm like, why am I so good at this? 
But then when it comes to my feelings, I'm just a fucking, I would shut down, like wall. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense because it's the same skill set. So I knew I had an emotional issue. It's a big emotional difference. And then I thought from like a relationship standpoint, I'm like, I felt, you know, a couple of years before I got engaged, I had this feeling in my stomach, like this might not be it. Mm. This might not be the right thing. And why did I buy a house and get a ring? Like, that's not logical. So I'm like, all right. I'm well, it can be depending out. on what you've been really taught is the logical steps, right? And yeah, it was logical it. from like, I'm going to be a good Catholic, which is boring. I didn't want to be, I'm still recovering from that childhood nightmare. But I mean, are we allowed to talk about religion? <laughs> um, but I started to really see that I wanted to get married by 25, have kids by 30, and yep. do all these things because... That was the story I was taught, yes. which doesn't make it yeah. not a beautiful story. It can be a beautiful yeah. story. As long as it's got meaning for you. As long as it's our fucking story, yeah. right? And so we spend so much time going, like, I did a finance degree. That's like the essence. Of, <laughs> first off, that's probably like taking a sleeping pill. I've never taken one, but I've done a finance degree and it felt like a sleeping pill. But secondly, I didn't want, I hate finance. Like, shit, I hate it. I was going to be a CA or do finance. And then I went into sales. Thank God that saved me. But, but for me, like, isn't that so fascinating? I love psychology. Now psychology is, I mean, psychology has always been a fascination mm-hmm. of mine, but it was like, it's amazing how much we deviate our life in order to live the past we were taught. Mm-hmm. And I was now like, I, I, I love this thought that, you know, when, when you begin to choose things that aren't yours, you begin to separate from self, right? Mm-hmm. And so conceptually, you're separating from your soul, let's call it. But you could call it our true self, the child in us. It doesn't really matter what words you use. So you separate from yourself. So you create this life that you're supposed to live, which yeah. is a lot of us, which is almost all of us, until yeah. we don't. Yeah. And until you have a fucking breakdown. Like yeah, I, you know what? Fuck this. Totally. Something doesn't feel right, go do something about it. Yeah, when you have Very heartbreak, simple. when you have any rock bottom brings you back. That's yeah. that's in my in my opinion, any rock bottom which can happen in finance, can happen in body, it can happen in emotion, it's usually emotion. Um, they all invite us to rejoin. And what I mean by that is you create this life of who you think you need to be, and you are this though, truthfully. And the pain you experience in life is the separation between the two. Yeah. And we're usually only a couple of decisions from rejoining. Mm. But they're the biggest fucking decisions. Yeah, they're and the hardest ones. And it's all that unknown. Right? There's a lot of unknown there. So much unknown. Yeah. But this is such a predictable path, right? Like yeah, we know you're going to get celebrated. Yeah, and this is one of the things I talk about a lot. Right? We, we stick with the devil we know. It's shit, but the clue is in the title, right? There's the certainty. <laughs> there's certainty. Yeah, there's certainty in that, yeah. And so there's yeah. comfort in that discomfort, of course, because we know it, right? Yeah, and I mean, there's so, there. I was so comfortable until all of a sudden my comfort was fucking destroying me, mm. like within. Yeah. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't, you know, my I was now on an information gathering path, and I was also starting to really feel the pains of being out of integrity. Mm. Like if I had a one night stand, I would have so much guilt, and I like I can literally remember one morning, showering. And, and my, my friends at college we used to say, you need to shower and shampoo. <laughs> funny, but not in hindsight, but it, it was funny. Yeah. Yeah, so we'd like to use funny shampoo. because? We had so much shame. Yeah. And you know, we were celebrating it. Isn't yeah. that fucked? Yeah. I never thought of that part. But, so. Um, but we feel we need to, right? Because then I'll get the kudos and that'll hopefully actually make me feel better. Right? Well, we're all that celebrating our we shame. Yeah. Like, oh, you got laid again. Amazing. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm like, uh that yeah, I yeah, man. shitty about myself. Uh, yeah. But I, you know, I created this. I, it's no one's do. fault but mine. Yeah. You know, like I had created this now where I didn't want anyone to see the pain from my 20 year old experience. So yeah. I was like, I'm going to be the best at getting chicks. I'm going to be the best at getting laid. And no one will notice that actually I am dying inside. My heart is destroyed. I have, I'm terrified of anyone loving me. And so I started to really you know, I was showering that one morning and I had a, an intimate encounter the night before. And I was like, this hurts every time I do it. I remember thinking that. And I was like, maybe I should just not do it if it hurts. Yeah. Like, that makes sense. So I started to read. But what's the alternative, right? Alone. Yeah. Very alone. Yeah. And or digging into the work. But when yeah. we don't even know that that's an option. I had no clue. Self-awareness is an option. Okay, so then bring us 
forward. You've got into this work to understand it. You know, at some point, change your own outlook on love yeah. and your and yeah. your own relationships. But now you're working with people, yeah. right? In terms of their connection and their relationships. So, so for the men out there, because I know a large amount of your audience is female, um, but for the men that you come across and deal with and, and talk to, what do you see playing out for them in, in, in their relationships quite often? Yeah, I mean, a lot of coaching clients are, of mine are men, and, and I work with couples too. Mm. Um, what do I see playing out a lot? I see, like, uh, and even, you know, formally for myself too, um, I see I, I'm basically just coaching old versions of me. Um, yeah, right? Like, same for you. I find that the one thing I see a lot is frustration from the sense that they feel nagged and not um, like they're able to do enough for their partner. Mm -hmm. Like, it's never it doesn't right. matter what I do, you're always nagging me, you're always on my ass. I hear that a lot. And and then, you know, you hear from the partner, like, I don't feel like he's trying, he doesn't do, you know, you hear that, you hear what drives nagging, essentially. Which is so confusing, right? Because it's like, I think I'm doing everything, he's not doing enough, it's like, what? what? And you're like, wait, we're missing each other. And, mm -hmm. and I yeah. think, you know, a lot of that can come down to love languages. You know, that's a simple, you can do that quiz for free online and find out what your love language is, what your partner's love language is. Yeah, because, so you can start to actually play on the same page. Yeah, where you can actually start different. to communicate love. Yeah. Now, of course, remember like, but, you know, some of the most valuable information I began to learn that was so helpful in my own relationships was knowing that a any criticism is an unmet emotional need. And so what that means, you know, so, and behind every criticism is a desired behavior. So what I mean by that is you might hear your partner say, like, you left the toilet seat up again, right? And, and I like this example because it's so simple. You know, it's like we've all probably experienced it, you know, where our partner falls in the water <laughs> at 1.30 in the morning, and it's kind of funny, but it's not. And they're upset and it could be the toothpaste cap yeah. off the toothpaste, it could be the towel on the bed. Any number of those little things. That we think, like, just let the little things go. But when we can start to see the impact those little things have, it changes everything. And what I mean by that is, it's, it's, we get stuck in the content. We get stuck on the towel, we get stuck on the toothpaste cap, we get stuck on the toilet seat, mm. and mm. figuratively. <laughs> and it's really what it represents, which is, you don't listen to me. Which means I'm not important. Yeah. You you don't respect me. Yeah. You don't care about me. My needs aren't important to you. Yeah. You know? I don't feel heard. Right. Yes. But I think as well that because because that's where respect comes in. But you know, being able to voice that because for me, respect is so big. Mass. Right? And so if you can call a guy hey, on that and say I I don't feel respected, he is going to sit up. And pay attention. You would hope, right? Like Especially if you've got the skill set to perhaps go, what do you need to feel respected? And all of a sudden, you know, there's some empathy there, hopefully. Yeah, if you're open to that dialogue, which yeah. I think, like, for the most part, couples, when they begin that awareness of that pattern, mm -hmm. the, the breaking of the pattern is quite interesting because the one person might express their emotional need and the other one gets defensive because they feel criticized. And so right away, we've now there's been an invitation to a different dialogue, but the pattern is so ingrained that this defensive mm -hmm. piece of us that feels criticized all the time, yeah. you know, isn't, and now there's the other side of that. Like, I, you come at me all the time, I feel nagged. You know, what mm -hmm. I need you to understand is that when you do that, I feel like I can't show up for you. I feel like I'm not good enough. I feel, yeah. it feels like it's never ending. I already feel like I'm trying to be, you know, everything around here, to everyone. Uh, what what else can I do? Well, there's no space for us to step into, you know, when someone's on our ass all the time. Yeah. There's no space. And so, mm. that, Indeed. yeah, to even step into, to yeah. say, like, let me get the goddamn towel, but you yell at me before the towel even hits the bed. Yeah. You know, like, you don't give me a space to succeed. And then the other yeah, part I yeah. see is, the partner makes the request, like, I want flowers, I want, and the person says, you only got me flowers because I asked you to. Yeah. Yeah, that's the fucking point. <laughs> You know, but I've heard that many times where the partner yeah, yeah. then doesn't How believe do I the gesture. Yeah. And so they've actually now just killed the gesture. So the vulnerability and the effort by the man of saying like, hey, like, this is what I want and need from you. And the man's like, yeah, let me go do that yeah. thing. Please, and because by the it. way, I really want to do that. Yeah, right? I want to So help a lot of the time you. we're in that kissing game. Yeah. yeah. Spice. When I see a lot too where it's like, you know, I was working with this really amazing couple where they get out of the car and... 
she's like, when we get out of the car, what I want him to do is go do this, this, and this. And every time he does this, this, and this. And I was like, well, have you ever told him that's exactly what you want? And she was like, well, no, he should just know. Yeah. And I was like, can you just turn to him? Because they were together. And I was like, can you just turn to him and just tell him exactly what you need? And she's like, what I'd like you to do is this, this, and this. And then he's like, thank you. Like, that, I'll do that every time yeah. I get out of the car. Easy. Right? So yeah. we have these, like, expectations that aren't being met, and we're placing whether we're loved on the expectation that's never even being communicated. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the times mm -hmm. the work is realizing that we're so used to being let down that we're actually creating moments to, be, to continue to be let down because we use the emotion of let down as a form of power. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I see that a lot in the, uh, you know, in the heteronormative female side of things. It could switch, though. It's, it's just a, a relational pattern. Yeah. Um, and if you really want to break that pattern as a male, is actually start doing the things they're asking without them asking. Yeah. Even if they criticize you or get on you, to be like, just as the male, it's, it's not being reactive. It's being mm -hmm. like, I hear being you. Proactive. I hear yeah. you. And so then what about, you know, taking the first step and asking? What yeah. do you need so that I can provide for you? That isn't just money, by the way, because that's where we've got caught a lot so of providing, good. right? Which, of course, is a big part of it most of the time. But what do you need that I can provide? When I think for us as men, you know, we haven't been socialized to learn our emotions. Like, mm. my emotional fluency was not fantastic. Um, but through time and through continued experience and continued effort, it continues to get better. Mm. You know, I'm by no means perfect or exceptional. I'm just constantly learning, yeah. but I'm also gathering tons of information because for me, being a great partner isn't just for my partner. It's because I want to be good at it. You know, I place my purpose and my self-worth in how am I showing up as a man for me, mm. you know, like, am I in integrity and alignment with my truth? That for me is everything. Because if I'm in integrity and alignment with my truth and my greatest abilities in that, if I'm getting angry at my partner, I'm not in my best. Yeah. You know, and I, you can always have a redo and apologize, but those angry moments need to get less and less because wherever we get triggered, there's work. Mm. You know, we have to get curious whenever there's that space. And for me, the greatest transformation came from saying, I'm going to take responsibility for how I show up in a relationship. Yeah. And I can't choose for my partners. But I can at least lead how to. Mm. And when I do that, then, you know, for the first time, a woman is going like, this man is inviting me to an emotional space I've never been to. Yeah. Which is fucking crazy to be at that place. But yeah. then to have a partner who's like, I meet you, now I invite you. Mm. And so it's this cool dance, which yeah, I'm sure yeah. you and Nardia have experienced yeah, a lot. Absolutely. Right? Which yeah. is powerful to say, like, I'm no longer okay with just being an average masculine communicator mm. and that's it you know like yeah. i don't want to just and you don't have to know all the answers right it's a continual process but again no, like, and you never will with anger in relationships you know that that is a, a, a common point and i'm sure you're you're hearing that a lot but like as you say understanding and digging into and is there a trigger there the other thing i think is super you know important for guys to understand and then be cautious around is not shaming some anger yeah and then course. stuffing it away anger right? is a healthy oh emotion. i can't have this yeah absolutely it's yeah. an emotion it's a thing right yeah. it's not good nor bad necessarily but you do if it's there you need to process it and then you can perhaps reflect and go now what happened there what can i learn for next time was there a trigger and so on well yeah knowing your emotional bullshit that you bring into your relationship which you do you know, you have to process the, the box of stuff that you're like, I'll just not look at, yeah. which is our childhood, how we relate, our past relationship patterns. Mm. Those all play today in the moments, you know, where we get angry and frustrated. And, and I love that you pointed out, it's like, it's not that anger is bad. It's aggression that is mm. disconnecting. Yeah. Anger can be very powerful from a transformational state, but I can be kind and angry mm. in that I could say like, fuck you, I don't want to talk anymore, you're pissing me off. That's aggression. But if I was angry, I could say, well, how you're being right now doesn't feel so good for me. And right now I need to disconnect from you to just take some space. Yeah. What a different way of communicating the exact same thing. Yeah. But I'm going to come back to you in 30 minutes. Mm. Again, I'm taking charge of my own emotional experience mm -hmm. and I'm being kind. I'm, I'm still maintaining connection as the baseline commitment I've made. Mm. But I'm also observational and aware of how my words can either create connection 
or disconnection. Yeah. You know, like I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I just, and distance as well, right? Yeah, and and us as men or women, I mean, it doesn't really matter. We, the most important piece is taking responsibility for our own emotional experience. Mm. You know, and and you were saying before, like being able to separate yourself from the anger, but still yeah. allowing yourself to be angry. You know. Yeah. Uh, I think that real transformation comes from saying, I feel angry, I am angry, which you have to become everything after I am, yeah. to yeah. I so feel. So being careful not to identify with the emotion. Exactly. So then I am, and then I like how when we say I feel, we separate from the emotion and we just feel it. Mm -hmm. We aren't it, we feel it. And then yeah. the next step is saying a part of me feels. And that way you get into this idea mm -hmm. in psychology they call dialectics. Where you can both be angry and still be in love. You can yeah. both be and frustrated yeah. and still care. Mm. You know, just like you can be starting a new job and be anxious and excited. Mm. So they can coexist. And that's why when we say a part of us, there's still a, a, a whole other part of us that loves our partner. Yeah. Well, open up to, to many other possibilities regardless totally. of the situation. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so powerful. You know, it's like when, when us as men start to see our partner feel loved and understood and stop nagging because that's annoying as shit, right? Like, and I say that with love, but I mean, like, it's hard to be in a relationship where we're always feeling criticized. Mm. And when we start to just do the little things and be proactive and actually do the thing because we know it makes our partner feel loved and prioritized, yeah, comes from mm. such a different place. Yeah, it tells them they, they are heard, right? Yeah. And then, of course, the flip being, constant being on someone means they are also not going to feel good totally and they're just going to be like Ugh. they're going to withdraw which will further trigger you which will further withdraw yeah. right yeah, yeah the cycle and the spiral okay so what next for macros for create the love which is your uh, very successful instagram handle oh what next uh, my move is moving to uh i'm starting to do work with corporate mm -hmm. um because for me what i find you were saying like most of my followers are female so about 87% of all of my social media followers are female, which makes you know a lot of sense from a relationship standpoint. They tend to want to consume more relationship information, or men do it in hiding. Yeah. Um, so what I really love is that the skills that go into being a great leader and a great teammate are the exact same skills that go into being a great partner. You're just hopefully talking about a few different things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm going to go into, I do currently go into businesses, talk to them about how to be a great salesperson, but how that actually translates to romantic relationship mm -hmm. outcomes, which, you know, we, we got to start talking about love at work, you know, mm -hmm. not about love mm -hmm. between employees from a romantic sense, although that happens a lot. Um, if people have really deep, fulfilling romantic relationships, the companies will thrive when people go through breakups and divorce companies are actually do experience a loss of productivity, you know, all these different things. Yeah. And I find like us men, we're like, yeah, I want to learn how to be a good leader or a good teammate lover. Uh, I don't know if I'll go to that one, but if it's under yeah, but the guise also of, I'm supposed to naturally be good at that anyway. Of course. Right. We were supposed to just come out of the womb. Yeah. Um, you know, just really good at relationship, yeah. which I realized like all of us, none for the most part, none of us get relationship education. So that's why I just love being able to teach old versions of me, which I'm, I'll, I'll continue to have, um, just like how to get to the next space. So yeah, because cool. we all can learn how to have really amazing, fulfilling relationships. Yeah. Be it romantic, professional, friendships, whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. Like it's possible for all of us. And that makes me so excited. So if you're mm -hmm. watching or listening and you're like, uh, I don't know, I'm like, no, I guarantee you, anyone can. Yeah. It's not impossible. It's actually... It's actually simple. Just and I think an important point there is it's easy to sit, perhaps, and watch this or anything, right? Like in the audience there the other night and go, hmm, okay, for some, maybe, or for you, or that person there, but my story is different and into that justification, yeah. right? And so everyone's got a different story, and just like your story around, um, um, can't let anyone in because you blah, 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 hurt, all that stuff, you could cling to that and go, this isn't appropriate, applicable to me, but it is. You know, it's just that the, the journey through it is different, of course, right? Yeah, I mean, it took me 14 years to even put that piece together. It took yeah. a girl, a woman, telling me, like, hey, Mark Rose. And I was like, shit. All these pieces fell into yeah. place, and hopefully some pieces fall into place for you guys. For Beautiful. Years. 
Well, I think we'll wrap thank that up, buddy. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for allowing us to film it in your house. Awesome. And uh, thank you for going beyond the beers. Pleasure. Love you, buddy. Love you, buddy. Click on the link below and go to beyondthebeers.tv. There, you can sign in to watch the rest of the episodes for free, as well as all the episodes of the show. Otherwise, make sure you share this episode with at least one man you think will enjoy or benefit from it. Now go out into your own life and start having these more meaningful conversations. Ask for help. Ask a mate how he's really doing. Or if he just wants to have a real conversation and go beyond the beers.